Benjamin Franklin wrote to a colleague, Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Well, that was about 230 years ago. Nearly 2,000 years ago, God's word told first century Christians of a third certainty beyond death and taxes. Resurrection to eternal life with God. Would you please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1? Chapter 1. We'll begin at the beginning. Ephesians chapter 1. If you're our guest today, that's in page 976 in those black Bibles underneath the chairs. Page 976. So the first people to hear this word all experience death and taxes under the shadow of the powerful Roman Empire. Those who were rescued by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ will also experience the resurrection and eternal life with God. So this Holy Spirit-inspired letter called Ephesians urges every Christian to remember that rescue and to live each day in light of that rescue. Well, while the, fear, the fearsome Roman Empire is long gone, God's word claims that with enduring certainty that God will fulfill his ultimate purpose. Well, today we'll see that we can live with confidence that God will fulfill his eternal purpose and display his glory through his church. Would you pray with me, please, as we open God's word together? God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is life to us. God, I ask that you would use your word, empowered by your spirit, to do your, week, your work here in your people for your glory. God, I recognize that I am made of dust and that only your spirit can empower what is about to happen. And so, God, I ask that you would have your way in me for your glory. And please come soon. Amen. Chapter 1, verse 1. Well, Ephesians opens with Paul identifying himself as an apostle by the will of God. So Jesus, the risen Christ, revealed himself to Paul and began to radically change everything in his life. Well, not too long after this, Paul's fellow Jews imprisoned him for proclaiming this radical truth that even people who were not born Jewish but trust that Jesus is indeed the promised rescuer that he promised the Jews, that they're counted as equals with Jews who recognize that Jesus really is who he says he is. But even in imprisonment, Paul wasn't discouraged. Paul knew that God was at work. He knew that the gospel could not be silenced. He knew that his imprisonment in Rome was for Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. Well, verses 3 through 14, chapter 1, celebrate the work of all three persons of the eternal God at work to rescue and adopt his people into his family forever. God the Father planned this adoption before he created the world. God the Son purchased this adoption by his own blood at the cross. And God the Holy Spirit preserves every believer's adoption to the praise of his glory. We saw that repeated three times, to the praise of his glory. So if you trust Jesus to rescue you from the eternal consequences of your rebellion against God and bring you into a right relationship with him as father, you can rest. You can rest knowing that your adoption into his family is secure forever to the praise of his glorious grace. Well, building on that praise is the prayer in verses 15 through 23, where Paul prayed that God would enlighten the eyes of their hearts to three wonderful truths that were already theirs in Christ. First, that they would know the hope to which he has called them. Second, that they would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then third, Paul prayed that God would be glorified as they learn to trust the immeasurable greatness of his power at work in them. It's verse 19, which is the resurrection power inside every believer, even today, through the personal presence of God the Holy Spirit. Well, we see that God, uh, God's word uh, inspires Paul here. Paul wraps up that prayer by celebrating the greatness of him who is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, 
not only in this age, but also in the one to come. <laughs> that means that God the Father put all things under the feet of God the Son and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. So there's a purpose being worked out here. Well, just as chapter 1 wraps up uh, uh, by celebrating Jesus and his exaltation, chapter 2 calls the church to remember the rescue. The Gentiles in the church had been spiritually dead in sin. They were born children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But then, God's eternal purpose moved him to do something miraculous, something radical that he had planned before he created the world. Verses 4 and 5 say that to, to show his rich mercy, to show his great love, God made his people alive together with Christ. Well, none of this could have been initiated or carried out by any of us because we were dead in sin. So being made alive together with Christ through faith is a gift of God's grace from start to finish. So then this new life for his people is this major milestone in the culmination of God's eternal purpose to be glorified in his church. Remember, his church was in his mind before he spoke the world into existence. Well, verses 8 through 10 of chapter 2 show that God is glorified as the Holy Spirit empowers his church to carry out a variety of good works which he prepared beforehand. That is to say, that the people who once walked in trespasses and sins and the ways of this world now walk in good works which God prepared beforehand. It's verses 1 through 10. Well, the second half of chapter 2 continues to weave the same thread that, that urges you and me to remember our rescue and live in light of that rescue. So Paul continues to address the Gentiles in verse 11. He reminds them that they were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Well, God's life-saving, life-transforming grace is celebrated again in verse 13. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So everyone, Jew or Gentile, everyone who believes God's promise that the righteous life and the sacrificial death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ counts in their place. Everyone who believes that is rescued from the punishment that we all deserve. For this rebellion against God that we were born into. It's part of our nature. So how miraculous that spiritually dead rebels are made spiritually alive children of the living God by his grace as received through faith. So God reconciles every believer, whether Jew or Gentile, to himself and to one another by the blood of Christ. So the gospel that reconciles us to God through Christ reconciles us to one another in Christ. Well, Paul becoming a minister of this gospel was a powerful display of God's grace. Just imagine, any, anyone who knew Paul earlier in life this devout, zealous Jew, even imprisoning Christians because he didn't believe that Jesus was God's promised Messiah. Anyone who would have known him earlier would be astounded at this radical transformation and it can only be attributed to the power of God's gospel. So the gospel is central in Paul's life. The gospel is central in Ephesians. The gospel ought to be central in our lives. This life-saving, life-transforming power of God's grace, that is, his undeserved favor, his, his unmerited, unearned favor, was demonstrated when God the Eternal Son took on human flesh to live and die and rise again and conquer sin and death in place of all who believe. This is the good news of the gospel. So, so then Ephesians urges every believer to learn that gospel and to love that gospel and to live out that gospel. According to verse 19 here, living out this gospel, this is chapter 2, verse 19, means no longer living as strangers and aliens who had no hope and were without God in the world, but now as fellow citizens with the saints, as members of the household of God. Spiritually dead rebels become spiritually alive children 
by God's grace. Well, in verses 19 through 22, paint a picture of, of every believing Jew and every believing Gentile built together in him to depend on him. Church, God the Holy Spirit is building his dwelling place in us to reveal and display and magnify the Father's glory through us. Even today, even today, God is we're continuing to carry out his eternal purpose to be glorified in his church. Not just this one, but his church throughout the world, throughout the centuries. For this reason, I, Paul, we're in chapter 3. Chapter 3 opens with the words that probably came as a shock to many in the gathered church in Ephesus. Now, we know it already. We know he's prison in Rome. We know that. We've read the book. But think of the new listener. Think of the new Christian. Paul left Ephesus maybe five or so years before he wrote this letter. So anyone in Ephesus who had become a new believer since then would have never met Paul. Maybe not heard much about it. So Paul wrote while he was imprisoned in Rome, remember by, by the Jews, because he was claiming that Gentiles and Jews would have equal standing before God because of what Christ had done. So this is a radical shift in thinking from the animosity that had lasted for generations. So he was imprisoned. So, well, since Paul didn't have <laughs> Twitter or Facebook, some of them might not have even known that he was in prison until he wrote, I'm a prisoner for Christ Jesus on your behalf. I'm a prisoner for Christ Jesus on your behalf. So Paul understood that his imprisonment was for Christ in the sense that it served God's great purpose. Paul's imprisonment in Rome was part of God's good plan to glorify himself through the salvation and the transformation of his church. So as chapter 3 begins, Paul, Paul's about to describe how he prays for the believers in the Ephesian church. Then he interrupts himself. He interrupts himself to explain, I just dropped a bomb here. I just told him I'm in prison. Some might not know that. I'm going to explain that, that God revealed a mystery to me. God, God revealed something that had, he had previously kept hidden, but he revealed it to me. Well, this mystery is described in verse 6 of chapter 3. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Well, we saw recently there are glimpses of this mystery throughout the whole Old Testament. God revealed that he would take the initiative, that he would rescue his people, he would, he would conquer sin and death that had, had captivated them. But previous generations had no idea that God's eternal plan would involve God the eternal Son taking on human flesh to accomplish this rescuing work. God continued to move forward can continue to move toward fulfilling his eternal purpose as he revealed that this rescue actually would involve sacrifice. So there were sacrifices regularly throughout the Old Testament. But, but they had no idea, even as they did that, that someday this rescue would ultimately involve the sacrifice, the crucifixion of God, the eternal Son in human flesh. Well, God revealed that his rescued people would include some Gentiles. We see a, a mixed multitude going out with the Israelites out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. But, but the Jews had no idea that, that the believers from every background would become one with no distinctions between them. They would become one in Christ. That is what remained a mystery until God did something entirely unexpected to unite his people. God brought believing Jews and believing Gentiles near to himself and near to one another by the blood of Christ. Who would have ever guessed that? And that in all these things throughout history, God continues to work to fulfill his purpose in the creation and transformation of his church, in the salvation and the transformation of his people. So God purposed from eternity past to glorify himself in this creation and transformation of his church. No plan B here. No plan B anywhere. So after the revealing of this mystery, 
verse 7 in chapter 3, brings to light the making of this minister. Paul says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of God's great power. God did this. God made Paul a minister to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery. Remember, he comes from a group of people that don't want any, anything to do with the Gentiles. And he's going to go and tell them about this unsearchable riches of Christ that could be theirs by faith. Why did God do that? Does it, God did this so that through the church, that unified body of people who had generations of animosity toward one another, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known <laughs> to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, even all throughout the spiritual realm and all throughout the earth. This is God's great purpose. He will most assuredly accomplish his great purpose. God's never frustrated. God's never fidgeting his hands coming up with a plan B. God's eternal purpose will never ultimately be thwarted. Even still, imagine getting this letter. Imagine getting to chapter 3. The Gentiles in the Ephesian church might have hesitated to have complete confidence in God's ability to carry out his purpose because he knew one of his main guys is in prison. God could have stopped that, right? Oh, man. Can I live with confidence here in Ephesus and the Roman Empire and all this crazy spiritual stuff going on, the, the darkness going on in this idolatrous city? Can I really trust this God? I mean, his main guy's in prison. What should I do? Keep reading. So building on the revealing of this mystery and the making of this minister is the certainty of this mission the certainty of this mission. So all that we've seen just now leads up to today. By God's grace, I think we will see, verses 11 through 13 of chapter 3, that Paul urges the first century Jesus followers in Ephesus, live with confidence, live with confidence that God will fulfill his eternal purpose. He will display his glory through his church. He will not let you go. Just think of how Paul longed for the Ephesian church to live with such confidence in the fact that God will fulfill his eternal purpose to be glorified in the salvation and the transformation of his people. Just, just think of this. Paul's saying, beloved of God in Ephesus, if you could just see God's purpose, see him working out his purpose, and live in God's presence, know that you can approach him with confidence. If you could see his purpose, you could live in his presence, then you can confidently rest in God's promise. Even in the uncertainty of this Roman Empire. I'm in jail. I could, I could be killed any time. But the gospel will not be silenced. Well, this biblical principle endures for us today. Trinity Church, when we see God's purpose and we live daily in God's presence, we can rest in God's promise. So this morning we're in verses 11 through 13. For context, I'll read verses 1 through 13 of chapter 3. This is the word of God. <clears throat> for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Well, this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan 
of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. So that, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Every Christian can choose to live confidently in light of the fact that God will fulfill his eternal purpose to display his glory through his church. So seeing God's purpose and living in God's presence will bring true rest in God's promise. I think that's what Paul's trying to get the Ephesian church to see, and I think that's what God's word is trying to get us to see today. So first, seeing God's purpose so God's word paints a picture of how God purposed in eternity past to glorify himself in the creation and the transformation of his church. So Paul knows that God wasn't surprised. Paul saw a real purpose in knowing that under God's sovereign, gracious hand, he was a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. We have a slide here with that first section underlined of Verses 3, 11 through 13. So God's eternal purpose was realized in Christ Jesus in the sense that not just the Jews, but Gentiles from every nation have been and would be brought near to God and near to one another by the blood of Christ. Everyone, everywhere, everyone from every background who's rescued by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, is a part of this church. And that, as the church is united in Christ, as the church lives out that unity, as we'll see in chapter 4 and following, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is being made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Okay. Church, in that sense, we are God's wisdom on display as we love one another well to his glory. But think of Paul. He, he's stuck in a pretty undesirable situation. <laughs> he, he's able to endure because he saw God's purpose in all things. That's how Paul was able to endure prison. You know, this morning I washed my glasses. I grilled out yesterday, so there's grease all over him from a cookout. Every Sunday morning I wash my glasses so I can see clearly, see my sermon notes, read scripture clearly. I would suggest to you that we are all wearing a set of lenses through which we interpret everything we see, everything we experience. I got to pick up Maddie, my little five-year-old granddaughter from kindergarten this past week. Let me just tell you, if you're not there right on time, right where you're supposed to be, she's probably gonna assume you forgot to pick her up from kindergarten. Your high schooler, on the other hand, might say, oh, maybe a flat tire, whatever, they'll be here, we'll figure it out. So it's a matter of perspective. We all wear lenses. We all see things through a certain perspective. So a theologian in the 16th century France said this. He said, Scripture is like a pair of eyeglasses which dispels the darkness and gives us a clear view of God. So we're all wearing a set of lenses through which we interpret everything we see and everything we experience. So what lenses are you wearing? What lenses are you wearing today? Do those lenses give you a clear view of God? Do you have a, a right, clear view of what God is like and, and why he does what he does? As I said, I wash my lenses so I can see clearly. Perhaps, by God's grace, we're in for a spirit-empowered lens washing this morning by his word. So if you're a Christian, whatever happened to you this past week, you can choose to see God's purpose in all things and rest confidently in the unchanging character, the unchanging purposes of God. You can go, oh, okay. So if you get some unexpected bad news, you can choose to remind yourself that God's never surprised. And it's not that God's unaware 
or, or unwilling or unable to act on my behalf. And I know that God's always at work for the ultimate good of his people, and he's working to form the character of Christ in me even when life is difficult. You can wear those biblical lenses. Or you can wallow in self-pity. You can believe the lie that God is surprised or he's off playing video games somewhere. Or, or somehow the God of the universe who you believe sent his son to die in your place really is somehow unaware of this difficult circumstance you're enduring right now at work or in your neighborhood or in your family. Or maybe he's just entirely unable or just unwilling to act on your behalf. Well, truth be told, God does carry out his ultimate purpose to be glorified in making you more like Jesus day by day. And that rarely comes when things are awesome and predictable. So are you looking to God's purpose? Are you seeing God's purpose? Are you wearing biblical lenses that help you see God's purpose? Remember that Scripture says God purposed even before he created the world to glorify himself in the creation and the transformation of his church. So in some sense, the church is created first in his head, in, God, in the mind of God. So, so God is doing something in you through every single circumstance you endure, good or bad. Are those the lenses you're wearing? What lenses are you wearing? How might something, some response of yours have changed this past week if you wore different lenses, if you wore biblical lenses this past week? Do the lenses you're wearing give you a clear view of God? Well, where can you find lenses that do? Ah, oh, Paul, you say this every week. <laughs> Here it comes. God's word isn't just to inform us. It's to transform us. So, beloved of God, take hold of this opportunity to spend time with God. He'll always meet you wherever you are. And then his word, as you read, his word, as you read in faith, his word, empowered by his spirit, will do his work in you for his glory. This week, I put a resource out on the welcome desk for anyone who wants it. It just says things that are always true about God. I encourage you to take one. There's a bunch of them back there on the welcome desk. Put it in your Bible. Put it on your fridge. Put it somewhere that you can uh, be reminded of God's great purpose. I encourage you to take hold of these truths. There are biblical references lifted there. Put it wherever you want so that you can see God's purpose in all things. God will train you. Renew your mind. Okay, so we see God's purpose. What about living in God's presence? Aren't we always in God's presence? Yeah, well, the phrase, in Him and in Christ are peppered throughout Ephesians. We have a slide of the second uh, section here is underlined in verses, verse 12. So Jesus Christ in his finished work brought us from being spiritually, str spiritually alienated strangers to being adopted children in him forever. So then God proclaims his glory through his church as we live each day in light of these realities of who he is and what he's done in our place. So do you live with the constant awareness of his presence? I remember as a kid, there were sometimes my dad's presence was really comforting. And there were sometimes my dad's presence was terrifying. And it was only terrifying when I was doing something that I knew I shouldn't be doing. Ephesians chapter 2 says that God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Beloved of God, you're seated with him now. Every Christian is always living in the presence of God in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So let's live like we know it's true. Let's live like we know it's true that we are always in the presence of God. Pam, my wife, has often told me that throughout her childhood, her six foot five dad with huge hands, no matter what happened, she knew that if her dad was around, everything was going to be okay. And you know, even, even that little girl named Pam, when she did something naughty, even then she always knew she could run to her dad with a bold confidence because of his love for her. There's something strong, something dependable, something loving 
that helped this little girl named Pam to be at peace no matter what happened because she knew that she was in the presence of her daddy. How would you like that peace throughout the week? That God is your father. Because of who Jesus is, because of what he accomplished in place of all who believe, every Christian can live as a child of God and approach him with this confident boldness. We have constant access. The Wi-Fi is never shut off. We have constant access to God through prayer. This is God, our Father. Not some distant machine who put this universe into existence. God, our Father. Now, please know, however, this is a humble boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. It's not a brashness that, brashness that says, things aren't going well, I better, better have a little chat with a man upstairs. We dare not. We dare not. This is not approaching God with a confident boldness. It's reflecting a haphazard foolishness. Talking God like, uh, about God like the man upstairs is, a, is this revealing a false idol. <laughs> it doesn't reflect the living God. So what about us? What about living in God's presence? Well, there's at least three opportunities available to all of us that can help us live with a constant awareness of God's presence. The first is gathered worship. The first is what we're doing right now. Colossians chapter 3 speaks of how the presence of God is powerfully felt among his people who are gathered to worship him. So beyond gathered worship, there's also small groups, prayer groups, Bible studies. There's a bunch of things meeting throughout the week for each of us to spend time in. So investing time in the small groups, investing time building relationships with the people of God, helps us to live in the presence of God. Hebrews chapter 10 speaks of meeting together so that we can stir up one another toward love and good works. This happens weekly in our small groups. Well, third opportunity that all of us can take hold of to help us live in the awareness of God's constant presence is investing daily in time with God, in prayer, in Bible reading. I want to say, if Bible reading is new to you, if you're like, ah, it's intimidating, there's words I can't pronounce, words I don't know what they mean, just start reading Ephesians. Six chapters, read one every day, you miss a day, don't worry about it. You get through it every single week. You keep reading Ephesians. And you read it in faith that it really is God's word, he's going to speak to you. You cannot keep reading God's word in faith and not be changed. God's word will do something in you every time you read it. Again, it's not just to be informed, but to be transformed. So all those things help us live in light of who God is and what God has done. That's how God proclaims his glory through his church. By, by, by people outside the church seeing us going, boy, that person's living differently now. That person's thinking differently now. That person's just interacting with people differently now. Faith isn't something you think. It's something you live out. So then seeing God's purpose in all things living with a constant awareness of God's presence at all times helps us to rest in God's promise. So come what may, we never need to lose heart because God promised his people that he will fulfill his purpose. This is that third section here. It's verse 13. We have a slide where it's underlined. So Paul probably lived for 35 years or so as a minister of the gospel. And he was jailed at least three times, the biblical record tells us. And frankly, he was often surrounded by people who wanted him imprisoned, probably wanted him killed. So Paul's path to joy and peace was not reminding himself that, oh, prison isn't so bad. But it's reminding himself that Jesus is so glorious. What gets you through? What gets you through? Acts chapter 16 even has an account of Paul singing hymns while he was in prison. <laughs> he was singing hymns in the middle of the night in prison, glorifying God. Paul's daily life painted a picture of these unsearchable riches of Christ that satisfied him beyond anything you could ever imagine in every way. Because Paul knew that he could rest in God's promise to fulfill his purpose. So as Paul wrote Ephesians, 
He was imprisoned in Rome. He was imprisoned for preaching the gospel to Gentiles. The Jews, they wanted him done away with because they're not us. They, they can't be with us. They're not God's people. But even in imprisonment and in suffering, Paul did not lose heart. He didn't lose heart. In fact, he was joyful as could be. As he was singing in prison. So then he says, hey, Ephesian church, I just kind of dropped this bomb in the middle of my letter to you. I'm in prison. And don't lose heart about it. Don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. The suffering is for you and it's for your glory. Well, I learned this past week that the, the verb translated into to lose heart in verse 13. It's found in ancient Greek outside the Bible. And it actually describes the experience of childbirth. Some of you ladies can know what I'm talking about. Or at least what this is talking about. For, from what I understand, most mothers, at some point in the childbirth process, are going, I can't. Just stop it. I can't. Can't get that thing out of me. They nearly lose heart. They nearly lose heart. And Paul says, don't. It might feel like that. It might get that painful. But do not lose heart. The gospel will not be silenced. So Paul urged the Ephesian Christians to not lose heart, but to carry on in their faith. He's essentially saying, look, I, I may be in prison, but the gospel cannot be hindered. God is at work. Carry on in faith, beloved of God. Carry on in faith. You can live with confidence. The gospel will continue to do his work in you and through you and throughout the world. Live with confidence. First century church in Ephesus. So, beloved of God, here in Ripon, we look back and see that Paul's imprisonment on behalf of the Gentiles painted a picture of just how far Paul was willing to go for them. Imagine the love they felt. You're in prison on our behalf? Oh, yeah, that's right, because you're in prison for preaching to us, and we wouldn't know if you didn't preach to us, and you're there on our behalf. Paul wanted to show them just how far he was willing to go for them. Which then that itself reminded them just how far Jesus had already gone for them in his crucifixion and in his resurrection. So God's word urged the Ephesian Christians and urges us today to see that life certainties go beyond death and taxes. The biblical principle in today's verses, as the worship team comes forward to have our closing song. The biblical principle in today's verses is that every Christian can add a third certainty. Death, taxes, resurrection to eternal life with God. Death and taxes probably won't stir you to action. Probably won't ignite the passion of your heart. But living in light of the resurrection will. Living in light of the truth of the gospel will. Seeing God's purpose. Living in God's presence. Resting in God's promise. This is God's intention. So beloved of God, you and I really can. We really can live with complete confidence that God will fulfill his eternal purpose to display his glory through his church. God can empower us by his word, through his spirit, and among his people so that we can see his purpose and intentionally live in his presence and rest in his promise every day he gives us life and breath.